launching pad uh, last week to try to get our hearts and minds together uh, into the word of the Lord. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27. This is a prophecy. There's many other places, several other places in the Old Testament that prophesy of a new covenant. God's going to do a new thing. God's going to change the old way, the old law, and he's going to give a new and living way. Um, this was not a strange concept even to Jewish believers. It was known that there was a promise of Messiah. There's a promise of change. Ezekiel uh, 36, 26, a new heart, the Spirit of the Lord says, also will I give you, everybody say a new heart, thank God, thank God for a new heart, and a new spirit, somebody say a new spirit, will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes notice the enabling power of his spirit being in our bodies is the enablement of us walking in true fellowship with God being obedient to his commands uh, and ye shall keep my judgments and you will do them you will do them uh, I'd like to read for you uh, also the book of Joel. It's not in your notes. If you have a pen or a piece of paper, I encourage you to write this down. down. Joel, chapter 2, verse 28. Again, this is Old Testament setting. Ezekiel was around the time of Babylonian captivity. Uh, Joel uh, is a little after that. Um, a little closer to Christ, none the yet several hundred years away from Christ. And this is what the Spirit of the Lord said through Joel. Verse 28, I'd like you to read this with me. It's on the screen for you if you don't have your Bible. Let's read it together. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your m young men shall see visions. Verse 29, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. What a prophecy. Hadn't happened yet. This outpouring, uh, this pouring out of God's spirit was a was something that was yet to come, and it was earmarked, at least in Joel, by the last days. Now, again, there's a great deal of emphasis being placed on what God is going to give to man that is going to make up the difference. Man, to this point, is falling short. Man, to this point, is not living up to the laws of God. Neither can they ever if they remain the same. But and if God could put something in them, His Spirit, could pour out His Spirit in them, that would be His answer to the deficient efforts of mankind. Now with a new Spirit, His Holy Spirit, living within them, they could walk a new life, talk a new talk, walk a new walk, have new direction, have new passions, have new desires. That would enable them, again, to do and to be the people God wanted them to be. So focusing on Joel in the last day, saith God, he said, I'm going to put my spirit, I will pour out. Listen to the words, I'm going to pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Uh, uh, also the servants and the handmaids. This is not, this pouring out is not just for the elite. It's not just for a section, but it's for the servants. And it's for the handmaids. It's not just for the head of the household. It's not just for those that are filing jointly. It's for everyone inside the home. All the way down to the lowest of servants and handmaids. So we see kind of dimly 
through the Old Testament, again, this desire of God to put His Spirit in people, and yet He hasn't done it yet. Can I ask why He hadn't done it yet? If this was God's plan, why hadn't He done it yet? I mean, if this was the answer to fallen mankind and broken mankind, why hasn't he, why didn't he do it in Ezekiel's day? Anybody? No, no, no questions? No, no. Waiting for people to see their need? Okay. Possibly. I, um, that, I'm sure some, some would fall in that category. Someone else. Why, why wouldn't, why couldn't he just do it then? What's that? God appointed a time. How many know that God had a date on the calendar? And he had it circled. And, he, and, he, and the prophecy that was given was on a day that God already had pre-planned in his mind that he was going to fulfill Ezekiel 36 and Joel chapter 2. How many of you believe that, that God already had a day, a specific day circled on the calendar? The... What had to precede the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was the sacrifice of blood. Because man had sinned. And there were already a set of laws and institutions that God himself had already spoken. That he could not just put his spirit in them before he paid the price of the sin which they had committed. And so the law of timing is so crucial for us to understand why the Holy Spirit came when it came and how it came and where it came. It wasn't haphazard. It wasn't without script. Everything that God was doing was under His own script and timeline. And he saw in Joel, and he even told his own people, that, I know you're messed up. Turn to somebody and say, you're messed up. You're, you're messed up. I know you're messed up, but there's coming a day when I'm going to help you. And your help is not going to come from the left. It's not going to come from the right. It's going to come from above. That's awesome. Many people thought that Jesus in his flesh was God's ultimate answer for lost humanity. But it was part, it was only a piece of God's answer for lost humanity. There had to be blood to right the sin of the hearts of man. It was essential there be a cross and there be a spotless sinless lamb that would stretch forth his arms god's own blood acts 20 28 he shed but he did all of that so that he could get to the fulfillment of ezekiel chapter 36 and joel chapter 2 John 7, 39, it's the back part of your sheet. This is approximately where we left off. That John the Revelator, or John the Apostle, picked up on the promise of Jesus Christ. It starts in verse 37. And in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried with a loud voice, saying, If any man thirst... Let him come unto me and drink. How many times did Jesus have this kind of language to his followers? It was often. Read your Bible. John chapter 3, John chapter 4, now John chapter 7, and then John chapter 14, and then John chapter 16. The book of John is literally filled with Jesus telling people, I've got what you need. Come to me. Now, the, the exciting part is, 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 is this is red letters in your Bible, my Bible. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, the Scripture already said that out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So there is an indication that everything that Jesus is saying is not new, but was recorded in the Old Testament. Look at the next verse, 39. 
39 is bracketed. Verse 39 is an understanding that John had according to what Jesus was saying. And this is John's... uh, uh, When you write something at the bottom of a Bible, it was his commentary. This is John's commentary. Verse 39 is John's commentary on what Jesus just said in his understanding. Do you know the book of John was written, you know, uh, you know, right around 90, 100 A.D., somewhere around in there. So it wasn't one of the first ones written. It was one of the last ones. And when he recounts in writing everything that Jesus said, he puts in brackets this verse, which totally sets parameters on the Holy Spirit. But this spake he of the Spirit. Let's read it together. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is what your Bible says. So while other people did have brushings up with the Holy Spirit, and even in, I was reminded last Wednesday night, Uh, of the scripture in Luke that the Bible says that there was a couple that was filled with the Holy Spirit. You could go to those places, but it wasn't that Holy Ghost. It was the Spirit of God. But this Spirit is what Jesus was talking about was the only thing that would fulfill Ezekiel 36 and Joel chapter 2. The Holy Ghost meant to redeem all of mankind, not just to help somebody prophesy, not just to help somebody be strong like Samson, the Spirit of the Lord moved upon Samson, but it wasn't the Holy Ghost. It didn't save him. It was a new covenant, a new day. Okay? And so this qualifies, do you realize that the problem in the verse with people not receiving the Holy, you know, no one had the Holy Spirit as Jesus was talking about in verse 39 when they were standing with Jesus. Is that real clear to you? No one had it. Was the problem their belief in Jesus? No. Their problem wasn't that they didn't believe in Jesus. What was the issue? The law of timing. The law of timing said that there had to be a sacrifice before there could be an outpouring. That was the law of timing. You could not receive the provisions of the cross and resurrection until it had happened. And the Spirit is a direct result of the price that Jesus paid and the power of His resurrection. And so the law of timing says in your Bible that it was impossible for people to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost until post-resurrection. Isn't that cool? This is why Jesus, when he was with his disciples in the latter part of Matthew, Matthew 28, Luke 24, Mark 16, and John 21, Jesus gave specific instructions to his disciples, go and wait in Jerusalem. Why? I already know what to teach because you told me. I already have great faith. By the way, where was the apostles' faith at this time? Did they believe in Jesus after they saw him risen from the dead? You better believe it. They were ready to take a bullet for Jesus right there. I mean, they really were. Peter had been transformed for the final time. I mean, he was ready to do it. And so, uh, uh, but they were told by Jesus, you're not ready yet. Just because you know what to say, doesn't mean you're going to have the power to go and say what needs to be said. Just because you know the Holy Spirit is for you is different than receiving the Holy Spirit. Knowing about the Spirit is good, but it can never be a substitute for being filled with the Spirit. So he told his disciples to wait. So based upon biblical evidence that you the bible that you have in your hand it 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 states and it tells us that the reason they gathered at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 was because they had not yet received the promise of the father the holy spirit this is why Acts chapter 2 is so vital in your bible and Many times, and in many doctrines of man, they don't even touch the book of Acts, and they just tell you John 3.16. The problem is, is that John 3.16 is pre-Holy Ghost. And you could only talk about it, you couldn't receive it. Does that make sense? So to teach the book of John without taking people to the book of Acts is only to teach believing 
but the salvation is in receiving. And there is a difference. The disciples believed in Jesus with all their heart, yet they were not filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Bible says that if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. It is the answer to a lost world. But it is also what's going to convict those that don't have it to be separated from Jesus. You cannot enter the kingdom of God, John chapter 3. You can't see the kingdom of God unless the spirit baptism is upon you. So my question is then, with this, when we're trying to identify patterns of teaching in the Bible about the Holy Spirit. We're trying to look critically at the scriptures and say, Let's understand what really goes on. We want to be authentic in our spirituality. Uh, we don't want to just know about the Holy Spirit. We want to know what did the Bible say happened uh, about these believers. Now, again, the, the question is there. When did Peter fully believe in Jesus Christ? That's debatable, but I know when he saw the nail-scarred hands. <laughs> that kind of cleared it up. But when did Peter receive the Holy Spirit for the first time? Even after Jesus rose and showed them the hands, they still were charged to go to and wait for Jerusalem because Jesus had to be glorified before he could pour out. And so they went. Peter fully believed in Jesus Christ, yet the Spirit, yet received the Spirit at a different time. Notice the pattern of the Scripture. And is this pattern important? Notice the pattern. Jesus or Peter fully believed in Jesus Christ, totally. Yet, the Holy Spirit, he did not and had not received the Holy Spirit yet. One cannot be biblically accurate to teach that the moment someone believes, they're automatically filled because Peter was breathing proof of the exact opposite of that doctrinal statement. Let that sink in just a minute. Others who had fully believed in the book of Acts awaited the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you. Acts chapter 8. Talking about systematic teachings of God's Word. Believing is fantastic. And please, no, I'm not talking about people's love for God. I'm talking about how they perceive the Scripture. And how you perceive the Scripture dictates what you believe for salvation. All right? Acts chapter 8, we're going to jump. The, the, the message of Jesus is preached. Look at verse 12. I want you to read it with me. Read it with me. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Did they believe? Was there true believing that went on here? That's for you to decide. You have to determine in your mind, am I going to die a sec? their faith because i can't look at people and say they truly believe or they don't the bible said they believed can you leave that scripture up so they believed philip preaching the uh, things concerning the kingdom of god and what else did he preach about do you know there's something about the name there is something to be preached about the name i don't really know that it's bible salvation if you don't preach about the name you can't be saved without the name. The name of Jesus. Uh, they were baptized. Everybody say they were baptized. Now, there is a doctrine that is very prevalent in our city. Again, not a reflection of people's love for God. But there is a doctrine in our city, and it's very strong, that when someone is baptized, it is, it is to confirm that they already have been filled with the Holy Spirit. The terminology is an outward sign of an inward grace. It, baptism does nothing for you. It is just an outward or external testimony 
of the new life transformation that has happened on the inside. I am not making fun. I'm saying this is the doctrine that is believed. People truly love God and they truly believe this. Okay? So they, they believed and they were baptized. That's fantastic exercises. Uh, even baptism is an exercise of your belief and your conviction in Jesus. Um, But the next verse that I want you to look at is verse 14. Read this with me. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. I wonder why. You ever wonder why? Why did Philip who's having basically revival, how would you would agree that revival was happening in Samaria? I mean, there was great joy in the city, there was miracle signs and wonders, there was all kinds of things. But when the apostles heard that Samaria had received the word of the Lord, they sent Peter and John. Well, the Bible will answer your question in the next verse, verse 15. Who, who, Peter and John, when they were come down, prayed for them. Who's the them? The people that had been baptized and believed already. They came specifically to have a prayer meeting with those believers so that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So here in the New Testament, we see true authentic believing, true authentic baptism, but that is totally separate from receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, we would be incorrect to say that the moment someone believes, they are automatically, if they truly believe, they are automatically filled with the Holy Spirit. That is biblically incorrect to say. Why? Because of this scripture is a word-for-word verbatim of what happened there in the book of Acts. That they might receive the Holy Ghost. Might means they had yet to. Look at verse 16. It even further underscores the reality that they, while believing is fantastic and great, baptism is fantastic and great, they still were needing the Holy Spirit. For as yet, he, who's the he? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, was fallen on none. Everybody say none. Only Philip had the Holy Ghost. Because I can take you to a scripture where the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Ghost. So the only person that was filled was Philip out of the entire city. But yet miracles and signs and wonders were happening all around them. Now this is a very, very important chapter in our Bible that will help us decipher which doctrines are authentic and which doctrines are good, but they fall short of biblical authenticity. All right? So as yet, he, the Holy Spirit, was fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So baptism does not underscore Holy Spirit existence in a person's life. It does not. When you see someone baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, it does not mean the Holy Spirit could have already been in them, but it does not necessarily mean that the Holy Spirit is in them because they acted in faith in Jesus Christ and were baptized. Isn't that awesome? That is very, very cool when we're thinking critically about the word of the Lord. We're looking at people actually being saved and what happened. Now, let's keep reading. Acts chapter uh, 17, eight, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 17. Then laid they, Peter and John, their hands on them, the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Ghost. Wow. My question to you is, how'd they know? How did they know? 
that the Holy Spirit had fallen on him. I mean, there was healings, miracles, great joy. There was faith, believing. There was baptism. And yet the Bible says when Peter and John laid their hands on them, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And the question is, how did they know? Everything in the book had already happened to them. Everything that people say, when you ask people, how do you know you're filled with the Spirit? A lot of people say, well, I felt great joy. Well, I was healed. I was in a wheelchair, and I got up, and I was literally healed. How many of you know that that's possible through the name and power of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It is absolutely powerful. But according to this verse, it is not evidence of Holy Spirit's indwelling. It's not. It's not. Neither is joy. Uh, and so you point at anything, you need to go home and read your Bible again, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 17, and you read everything that happened to these people, and yet the Bible specifically separates all of these other experiences and says that there was a Holy Ghost experience totally separate than anything they had happened before. And look at the next verse, verse 18. We do know this about it. Simon saw something. The Bible does not say what he saw. But Simon, the onlooker, watched people receive the Holy Spirit and offered them, he pulled out his city bank and said, dude, I don't know that he called the apostles dude, sirs, that is awesome. Give me the booster shot so that whoever I lay my hand on, that will happen so he literally saw something happen and and my my thesis tonight is that that something still happens today and it still marks the indwelling of the Holy Spirit there was not a magical moment right after the book of Acts just before you step into Romans where the rules of the game and the expectations of the apostles stopped and everything shifted. That is a doctrine in some cases. That there was a major shift in how God saved people. No, no, no. The blood's still the blood. The spirit's still the spirit. And the power of God is still the power of God to change people. We still need the same spirit that they had. We still need the power of God that they had. We still need the experience of God. And we need to know, has the spirit come into our life or not? And if you're using your own thoughts and your feelings and it doesn't line up with the Word of God, I shudder to think, could we be teaching people that they have the Spirit when in fact they do not have the Spirit? And how damaging is that? How destructive is that? The reason that the people of Samaria were willing to go into a prayer meeting to receive the Holy Ghost was because they were told, it's not, it hasn't come on you yet, but when Peter and John come, we're going to pray for one thing. We're going to pray for the Holy Ghost to come upon you. Well, how are you going to know? Peter and John had to know how. They had to know how. Isn't that awesome? That's absolutely incredible. Okay, so let's, let's go. So how did Peter know when he received the Holy Spirit? Uh, this is called the day of Pentecost. How many of you heard of the day of Pentecost? This is the day that Ezekiel 36, 27 and 28, this is the day that was circled on God's calendar. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, was what circled this point, and I'll prove it to you. Let's read together. This is the apostles. Actually, uh, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts 2, 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, who's the they? You'll find the answer to that question in your Bible. Acts chapter 1, verse 13. And when they, Acts chapter 1, verse 13. And when they, Who's the they? It's about to live. Were come into the upper room, their abode, and it lists the 11 disciples. And then it says, verse 13, or verse 14, these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplications. What were they praying for? 
what were they instructed to go and wait for? The promise of the Holy Spirit. There was no confusion as to what they were waiting for. There was no question mark. It was, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. We're just here, and the Spirit bed us, and we're just here. No. Jesus said, I will send the promise of my Father upon you, and you're going to get it, but you got to wait. They're saying, God, send your Holy Spirit. You said you would send it, and we're not moving until you give us what you said you would give. They weren't waiting for a new revelation of who Jesus was. They knew who he was. They were waiting on the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Which they knew about it, but they didn't have it yet. So, when the day of pity... These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren. Verse 15... And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. So we know that there were 120 people in that upper room. Fabulous how God even gave us how many people were up there, isn't it? 120 people. What about all the crowds that followed him? Only 120 made it to the upper room. Isn't that crazy? 120. And then in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, the 120, were all with one accord in one place. Read this with me, verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. How did Peter know that he had received the Holy Spirit? There was a spirit evidence, not a human reasoning. There was a spirit manifestation, not an act of a person's faith. The Spirit's indwelling is something God does, not something the believer does. You must be born again. This is what Jesus saw when he was talking to Nicodemus. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is what Jesus was looking at. This day that he circled on, on his calendar, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, verse 5, what happened? There was no small stir in Jerusalem. Speaking in tongues is not just a language that you are able to speak. It is, it is a spirit, it is a language that the spirit gives. The one that speaks in tongues does not know what he is saying. It's not supposed to. Notice in Acts chapter 2, there was no interpreter. There is a confusion of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In certain doctrinal beliefs, they will reach into 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and try to explain away tongues as the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit. Because the word tongues does appear another place in 1 Corinthians 12. That's another study. However, this that came, it was the initial experience of all of the apostles. So if you were to ask the apostles, what happened to you when you received the Holy Ghost, what would they say? Every one of them. I spoke in tongues. Who was doing that? Oh, God, a little freaky, I know. A little iffy because it's outside of my control. But if you were to ask the Apostle John, when you get to heaven, you say, hey, how did you know you received the Holy Spirit on that day? He's going to say, I was in an upper room one day. And I began the Spirit of God. We were praying because Jesus said to wait. And we're being obedient in faith. And Jesus said he would send it. So we're saying it's coming, it's coming. I don't know when. I don't control the Spirit. But when it comes, it'll make a sound. There'll be a phone There'll be a language. Jesus said. So every one of the apostles had the same exact experience. Everybody say same experience. All were filled. So now, mind you, you're establishing... 
certain expectations that the apostles have because who is it that's going to go into all the world and preach the gospel? The apostles. So you're establishing an expectation from the apostles. And all they have is their reference point. What is their reference point? Jesus said it. I believed it. And it came on this day. And this is how I knew that it was exactly what Jesus was saying. Isn't that cool? So it's undeniably there in the scripture. The question is, is it still what happens today? Is it still the evidence for today? Is it still biblical to believe that? Or is it biblical to believe that the moment you believe, you have already been filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, we haven't even seen that at all yet in the Scriptures, in the initial evidence of the Holy Writ. Okay, so this was noised abroad. If you read verse 5 through verse 11, there was a great group of people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost because it was Pentecost. Pentecost to them was an Old Testament celebration, not a New Testament phenomenon. This day forever changed the word Pentecost, right? So when you say I'm Pentecostal, if you ever hear somebody say I'm Pentecostal, you know what they're identifying with? This outpouring of God's Spirit. That's what Pentecostal originally meant. Now, there's a lot of different definitions today. But that's the original and authentic spiritual definition of understanding what Pentecost was. So when these people, uh, they were in the upper room, evidently somehow people heard them speaking in tongues. So they weren't in the, in the country somewhere with no lights, with, with, with nobody around them. They were surrounded in an uncharacteristically busy Jerusalem at this time. And people began to hear this supernatural language that the people that were being filled with the Spirit of God did not know what they were saying, and yet people on the outside could understand what they were saying. And it lists everywhere these Jews that had traveled back home were from. And they knew the language from where they would come. And, said, and they said this, Verse 11, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our language or tongues the wonderful works of God. Notice they weren't preaching the gospel. How do you know that? Because the rest of the chapter is dedicated to Peter preaching the gospel. If you could preach the gospel in other tongues without you even knowing what you're saying, there's no need for Peter to preach. But what did speaking in tongues do? It grabbed and arrested the attention. And it prompted, listen to me, it prompted one question and the rest of Acts chapter 2 is dedicated to answer one question it's awesome look they said we hear these people speak the wonderful works of God verse 12 read verse 12 with me and they were all amazed the people that were hearing this they were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another what meaneth this? I want you to underline that this or that, that question in your Bible. What meaneth this? Can I ask you what this they were referring to? They weren't asking, is the Spirit of God real? They weren't asking that question. They weren't asking, is Jesus Christ risen? They weren't asking that question. What does that, if you were the message Bible, <laughs> interpret that last question? What meaneth this? Somebody give it a step. You're the message Bible. Fill in the blank for us. Okay? The this. What is the this specifically pointing to? The babbling. The tongue. It was so amazing. What is that? That was their question. They already knew who God was. They were Jews. They were Jews. They were mind blown. And they had the question, what is this? Verse 13, other people, other people's response. Let's read this. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Their explanation for 
that tongue was what? They're drunk. How many of you know the more intoxicated you get, the more unintelligent you become? Especially if you don't even know the language. <laughs> but that was their analysis. So you have two differing opinions. One said, what is this? Others were making fun of it. They were mocking. Oh, those guys are just drunk. Okay? Verse 14, but Peter stands up with the eleven and lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Verse 15, what question is he trying to answer? What it is. <laughs> what is this? What means this? What is this? These aren't drunk as you think they're drunk. It's only third, the third hour of the day. The third hour of the day is 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay? It's a measure of how much daylight in a particular day, and then you divide that by 12 in the first third. So in our, in our clock, it's 9, 12, 3, then 6. Okay? So he, the, he says it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Look at verse 16. He answer, he's trying to answer the question. Read this with me. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is referring to what? Tongues. He said, is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel. He quotes Joel, which you read with me at the beginning of our Bible lesson. It shall come to pass in the last days. Ladies and gentlemen, when the Bible talked about the last days coming, we're there. How do we know? Because the Word of God just defined itself. It's the last days. How do I know? Because Joel said in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Peter said this is the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. You're walking in prophetic fulfillment times, Jerusalem. It's a brand new day. Do you know that they hadn't even preached the message of salvation yet? For all intents and purposes, brothers and sisters in the Lord, this was the birth of the church. Because if there's no spirit, then you have no church. Can I say that again? This is the birth of the church because if there is no spirit, you do not have a church. Our salvation is not predicated on our believing. But does that believing lead us to Holy Spirit baptism? And it is the Spirit that gives life, not believing. Believing is essential. But believing cannot do what only the Holy Spirit can do in our life. So he quotes Joel chapter 2. Now, let's keep reading. He, he goes on and preaches the fact that Jesus Christ died and buried and rose again. That's the gospel. That's in... That's in uh, verse 23 through 25. Let's go down and look at verse 33. Therefore, this is awesome. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, speaking of Jesus, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he, God, hath shed forth this which you now, what and what? What were they seeing? What was the question initially by the crowd? What means this tongue talking what is it and Peter says to them what you are seeing and hearing do you know it's possible to see people get the Holy Ghost do you know it's possible to hear people get the Holy Ghost what you are seeing and what you are hearing is the promise being fulfilled it's the identifier of Holy Ghost baptism it also can be said like this. It is the initial evidence of someone receiving the gift 
for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, see and hear. I take you back to John chapter or Acts chapter 8. What did Simon see? Because he saw the Holy Ghost come on them. The only thing that has yet to happen in Acts chapter 8, if you'll read very carefully, the only thing that had yet to happen, there were miracles, signs, wonders, joy, baptism, believing, faith, turning from sin. It was all there. The only thing that wasn't there, guess what? Was tongues. And when Peter and John laid their hands on them, they were filled with the, how did Peter and John know? That is awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not a guessing game when people get the Holy Spirit. It's not a, ooh, I don't know if people did or did not. There's a supernatural, in the Bible, it talks about a supernatural presence. My question to you is that, does that still happen today? Or did someone flip a switch and change the doctrine? This is a very important bridge that we, as individuals, have to cross. Okay, what meaneth this? You see it, you hear it, this is that. The initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost set the expectation for what would happen to people initially when they receive the Holy Spirit. There are not two ways to receive the Holy Spirit. There is not a personal experience that you have that is unidentifiable from another person. Otherwise, no one could be sure you could not preach a message with certainty that this is that very Holy Ghost. That's awesome. Tongues was the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit. And Peter went on to say that the gift of the Holy Ghost... And look at Acts, uh, 30, Acts 2, 37. Now, when they, the people, heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles. So it wasn't just Peter on the hot seat. Every one of the apostles were asked. What do we do? Everybody say, what do we do? I need somebody to translate the message. The message version of that question. What was their initial question? What is that? through long-windedness like preachers do, made their way all the way to say, this is that. You're seeing it, you're hearing it. And they said, their heart was pricked, and they said to Peter, what do we have to do? For what? I want that. If that's from God, and I believe what you're saying, how do I get that? Isn't that an awesome question? Then Peter said unto them, repent. How do we get the Holy Ghost? You got to repent. Acts 2.38. Repent. Read it with me. And be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. What for? Why do we baptize in Jesus' name? For the washing of sins. There's all kinds of different denominations that have different teachings on baptism. But I've already showed you that it is not just an outward sign of an inward grace. Because that, that doctrine says you're already filled with the Spirit. We've already shown you in the Word of God that that's not true. But it does say that it needs to be in the name of Jesus Christ and it's for the remission of sins. Ladies and gentlemen, if baptism in fact does wash away your sins, it's essential. Because God, has, God deals with the sin problem as well as the lack of power problem. He deals with the sin problem with His blood. And He deals with the lack of power problem with His spirit. You must be born again of water and spirit to enter in the kingdom of God. Jesus was pointing right here. It all ties together. It says, it, it be baptized every one of you for, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive that. Isn't that awesome? The very first question was, what is that? Peter answers, this is that. He tells them, and then they say, how do I get that? Peter tells them. Ladies and gentlemen, do you think that Peter and all the apostles went to the town five miles away? 
Now they're commissioned by Jesus Christ to preach salvation to the nations, right? They go to the next town and people say, hey, how do I be saved? Would they change what they just established in Jerusalem? Did they have the authority to change it? Did they have the authority to redefine it? Did they have the authority to say, well, I don't like you, or I like you, or, man, you've got a great love for God, so that means you already have it. No, they have already been set. The expectation and the message for salvation is out of the box. And any man that changes it is not changing what the apostles said. They are changing what Jesus Christ ordained from the very beginning. This is why, this is why Romans 16, 17 says, if any man teach anything contrary to what we have taught you, mark them and avoid them. Why? Because they're messing with authentic spirituality. So, here we are in the, in the middle of God's word. The doctrine of believing interprets speaking in tongues as a gift that is only for some people. But let's, let's dismiss that. This speaking in tongues was not the... This, this thought process that the tongues was only for a certain few was not the expectation of the apostles. It was not. As they went from city to city. Uh, we already read Acts chapter 8. Let's read Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 is about a man by the name of Cornelius. How many have read of Cornelius? I'll spare all of the details, but it's a fantastic God read and God encounter. Suffice it to say, God aligns Peter with a house that needs the Holy Ghost. These people already loved uh, Jehovah. He preaches Jesus Christ unto them, and as he's preaching, look at verse uh, look at verse 43. To him, this is what Paul, Peter saying, gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Where do we get remission of sins? Baptism in Jesus' name. Through his name. Okay? While Peter, let's read verse 44 because you need to read it too. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them that heard the word. Verse 45. And they of the circumcision which believed, which were astonished, as many as came with Peter. So wait a minute. Peter's in a Gentile's house. This is big. Peter's in a Gentile's house. The tongue speaking was normal for Jews. The circumcision. But the big deal was they did not know that the tongue or the Holy Spirit's indwelling or the message of salvation was supposed to be preached to Gentiles. This is the very first Gentile. And so when Peter's preaching, in the middle of preaching, the Holy Ghost begins to fall on all them that heard the word. And the people, the circumcision, the Jews that already had the Holy Ghost, were astonished. Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. I got a question. How did they know? How did they know? I mean, you, you can't, you. there's doctrines that say, you know, well, just when you believe. Again, does that fit? When you feel joy, I can't always see joy in a person's heart. Or a miracle, that's not always a sign. We're trying to establish, does the Bible give us ample record to show us when and how the Holy Spirit comes into our life? Verse 46, how did they know? Read this. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. How did Peter know, as a standard rule, people received the Holy Ghost when he went from house to house? He's waiting for a sound. He will preach. That's why preachers sometimes will preach until they hear something. <laughs> and it's not always the Holy Ghost. But, but uh, uh, Peter, this was norm. Not the exception. This was the norm for Peter. And this was a Gentile. So the, the argument that the Holy Spirit was only for the Jews, which some people believe, the tongue was only for the Jews, and it ceased, is eradicated because of Acts chapter number 10. Acts 19 as we close. Paul wrote two-thirds, probably or so, plus or minus a little bit of the New Testament. So a lot of people say, well, I believe what Paul said. He was a big guy for believing. Okay, 
Uh, you, in all of his letters, do you know that from Romans through Jude, those were all letters written to saved people? That Paul considered them to be born again and saved. His language is going to be different than if he's looking at somebody on the street and they're wanting to be saved. So let's go to a place and let's find what Paul preached when he met somebody if he didn't know that they were saved or not. Let's read that. Because then we can know a surety that the message did what Peter preached is that exactly what Paul preached. Look at Acts chapter 19. And it came to pass, verse 1, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and he found certain disciples. He said, Paul said to them, the people that he found, the very first question he said was, have you received the Holy Ghost? His question wasn't, do you believe? He knew they were believers. The question was, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He wasn't calling to question their belief. He was asking them a simple question. Has your belief led you to the indwelling and infilling of the Holy Spirit? And they said, we have not so much as even heard if there be any Holy Spirit. How are you supposed to tell? I don't know. What? What? Verse 3. And he said unto them, unto them, what then were you baptized? Water baptism. He's speaking of water baptism. We know this because of their response. And they said unto John's baptism. Verse 4. Paul said, John baptized with water. Or baptized with the baptism of repentance. Saying that you need to believe on somebody that's coming after me that's on Christ. So they had believed John's message. It was a message of repentance. They believed to that far. But as wholehearted as they were, they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Paul picked up and said, I know where you're at. I'm going to preach from this point forward because you already believe. I'm going to build on what you believe. When they heard this, what happened? They were baptized again. You mean it matters how you're baptized? Yes. If it's not done the way the apostles did it, somebody's wrong. I'm going to do it the way the apostles did it. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, why is Paul laying his hands on them? Again, if the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is the moment you believe and baptism is a sign of, of the Spirit that you've already believed, this scripture is out of line. But it is, it is, it is to the church at Ephesus. And Paul lays his hands on them for what purpose? That they might receive the Holy Ghost. The, when he laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And the very first thing that happens, the Bible says, they spoke with tongues. There are other places in your Bible as we close that will say they believed what the apostles preached and were saved. It is, po it is impossible for you to say, see, they only believed there. It doesn't say they spoke with tongues. The message that the apostles were teaching was one. If they believed it and the apostles wrote that they were saved, they had the exact experience on getting into the door of the kingdom of God. So everyone that says they believe necessarily isn't filled with the Holy Spirit. But everyone that has been filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what? How did they get there? They believed. That's awesome. Let's stand. I thank God for His Word today. Thank you for letting me talk plainly to you. If you have further questions, I, I, I beg you, read the Word of the Lord. I know you love God. I know you love the Word. You're here tonight. Um, but but I, I pray I've done a, a good job trying to express, uh, man, the Holy Spirit. It, it, it's one of the greatest gifts God's ever given. People ask me, hey, how do, I, how, do, how do I get saved? I'll tell them, repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, all of you, for the remission of sins, and you'll get the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what Paul said. That's exactly what Peter said. So at Bethel Christian Ministries, I don't, I don't want I, I can't change it. I just, I, I want to believe it more. I want to believe the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this incredible time in your word. Lord, you're a gentle God. Lord, you are ever patient. 
ever loving. We ask for your mercy in these things. That sometimes our human minds have difficulty unlearning things and learning things. We wrestle with certain spiritual concepts and, and, and control and different things. Lord, you see our hearts today. This is truth. This, 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 is, this is the truth of your word. I pray that you would let this truth find a lodging place in every heart tonight. Let it grow. Let it bring forth fruit according to your word. Make it prosper, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight.